You stand in the presence of Daenerys Stormborn of House Targaryen, rightful heir to the Iron Throne, rightful Queen of the Andals and the First Men, protector of the Seven Kingdoms, the Mother of Dragons, the Khaleesi of the Great Grass Sea, the Unburnt, the Breaker of Chains. Daenerys Targaryen flew on her dragon and destroyed, decimated the entire city that she wanted to rule. With one solitary dragon, she beat all the defenses. We have here a retired Air Force Colonel, Dan Mosqueda. Hi Dan, to talk to us about her strategy, her Air Force strategy, and what we can learn from actual Air Force strategy about what she did, what she should have done, what she shouldn't have done. Hi Dan, how are you? I'm great, Gil. How are you doing today? Very happy to have you. We've been talking about doing it, trying to do this for a very, very long time. <laughs> and continually gets uh, interrupted, <laughs> canceled for many reasons. But uh, it's, it's really great to be here. And I, I appreciate the opportunity. I was a space and missile officer in the Air Force, so I wasn't a pilot. Space and I, missile, okay. Yeah. The space mission of the Space and Missile System Center is to research, develop, test, acquire, and sustain military space vehicles, satellites, and space control systems. We also furnish the United States and Allied forces with ground, shipboard, and airborne equipment to access those satellites in support of military operations around the world. I retired from the U.S. Air Force as a lieutenant colonel, actually. Um, so that's uh, so lower than a colonel, but um, anyway, right, it's, okay. Okay. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. It's okay. It's all right. Okay. Uh, and uh, while I was in, I did uh, get a master's uh, in air power theory. So mm. we, we looked at how do you fight uh, an air war? And the interesting thing about uh, this particular degree was we went back into the earliest days of flight, practically back to Wilbur and Orville Wright, and even before that from mm. balloons. I remember Trump said something about airports in the Civil War. He didn't go back to how about <laughs> uh, air war in the Civil War. No, that wasn't wasn't that okay. In June of 1775, it took over the airports. It did everything it had to do. And at Fort McHenry, under the rocket's red glare, it had nothing but victory. Uh, yeah, there were no airplanes. Uh, they may have used uh, some balloons, but definitely no airplanes. No, no, the president said so, so I'm, I'm sure you must be wrong. I, I must uh, be, sorry. You must be, sorry. Yeah. Okay, so, so, so tell us through the eyes of someone with some expertise or with, or in Air Force strategy. When you watch this episode and the way that she used her airplane, for lack of a better word, with all the anti-aircraft weapons over there, no other airplanes in sight. She has like total air superiority. What were you thinking about the way that she was using it? When she was uh, fighting or burning all these scorpions. Well, um, if can, is it okay if I step back just a little bit to? It's it's perfect. What goes through my mind is when, you know, they were basically shot down and she loses. Yeah. Uh, if we even go back to where uh, they're, uh, they're north of the wall. The yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so she loses a lot of her capability. And my immediate thought then was she really didn't think through very carefully <laughs> how she should use them. And especially here's the thing. Tyrion. Uh, for instance, who uh -huh. he drinks and he reads and he knows stuff, right? Mm. And I'm thinking if her ancestors were flying these dragons and took over the whole continent, it seems like he would have learned how did they go about doing it, right? right? And advised her. You know, right. otherwise, you know, that, that's why we go back uh, into the early 1900s. Uh, for okay. any Air Force, because, you know, the first thing you want to learn is you want to learn all the rules, practice them, know them by muscle memory before you decide you're going to break any of the rules. Right. And maybe you want to learn from other people's mistakes 
And oh yeah, successes. for sure, for sure. But I'm not sure it's Tyrion's fault or her fault. I think it's uh, the fault of Dan and Dave, the creators of Game of Thrones. Well, that's that's probably very true, and you know, part of their their problem is I don't think that they relied on enough um, expertise to help them understand right. how this would have really gone down. I think you're being you're being very generous. I don't think they relied on any expertise, but uh, <laughs> I don't know. Could be wrong. So, I did I did I did see them though. They still are they're still touting Drogon, uh, you know, in a on another HBO show. Yeah. I, don't wanna, I don't wanna give any spoilers, so Yeah, I'll, no, that was an annoying part, but let's uh, yeah, move yeah, on let's from go. there. I, I'm gonna give them a little bit of the benefit of the doubt for North of the Wall. Uh, because there's no way she could have known uh, that um, oh man it's been a while Gil since I watched it what's the name of the bad guy that's terrible uh, the Night King <laughs> yeah that, no, the, I think it's uh, like an emo- like emotionally maybe you blocked it out because yeah of, maybe uh, yeah. Yeah. so he she, threw she, yeah she, she couldn't know that he was such a javelin thrower that could have uh, I'll, I'll, I'm gonna let that one slide but okay. when she went down and they were flying over it it really demonstrated her unhinged mental status even before we get to the last episode and maybe a mix of her arrogance because I don't even know what her military objective was because in reality, what what was she trying to do? Um, So they fly over, uh, you know, they get... One down, one down. In bad shape, one down, and now she's down to to just Drogon, right? To be fair, in the final episode, she does do the first thing you got to do to establish true air supremacy, and that is she takes out all of those uh, scorpions. Mm-hmm. In in most um, norms of warfare, you're going to stick to what we call counterforce targets, which means, which means? something that can uh, hit back. Uh, instead, she went after what we call counter value targets. And a counter value target would generally be non military, non intelligence related things. Because she could have easily gone in and uh, did what she did, taken out all of the necessary military targets, and then just walked in and taken the city. Yeah, so, it's hers. Yeah. Yeah, it's hers. So fundamentally, if you if you look at that last episode on its second, own, second to last. Oh, uh, sorry. Yeah, second to last yeah. episode on its own. She did what she needed to do, uh, except she didn't need to be a war criminal. But she was very successful. She so she did learn from the mistakes that she made. Is it usually that easy for one aircraft to get rid of? dozens and dozens of anti-aircraft missiles. What can we learn from that about the way that it's actually happening in real world uh, battles? Well, I mean, that's very unrealistic. You're not going to do it. Even if when you you step back and look at the initial raids on Iraq after Saddam Hussein took over um, Kuwait. Mm -hmm. So this is the first Gulf conflict. 1991. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We went you know, we went in with, you know, squadrons of stealth aircraft to do what she did when she burned up all the scorpions. Well, we did mm-hmm. the same thing. We went in and we took out all of his anti-aircraft. Mm-hmm. So we went after what we call the centers of gravity. And so she didn't, she should have softened the city up prior to what she did so that you know, her last thing would have just been a walk in the park. Because if you have good air supremacy, you know, we do our work so that then the army can just walk in and do the easy job of uh, cleaning it up. And then somebody else has to do the difficult job, uh, as we learned in Marine, of um, uh, ruling it later on. Okay. okay, that was interesting. I would like to to hear more about, as, as much as, as you can, whatever, all things considered, uh, about the way that you use the the air force uh, in Iraq, can you elaborate about that a little bit? Yeah, sure. So um, the whole idea was that, uh, and in general, this is just how you would do it. Even 
uh, even in ancient times. I mean, you want to get in quietly and the concept is to soften up your targets. And you want to take hard targets and make what them soft hard targets. targets. Hard targets are the ones that are very difficult to uh, take out. So, for instance, um, if you went to uh, an airport in, say, Tel Aviv, where it's very highly guarded, versus, let's say, an airport in a more rural part of the world where the threat maybe isn't as great, the other airport would be a soft target. Tel Aviv would be a hard target. Does that make okay. sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and, a, and an example of this, uh, that once the F-117 stealth fighters went in, did their job, then we were able to go in and use the uh, bunker busters. Mm -hmm. So the idea here is these things went deep down into Saddam's command and control uh, efforts and we were able to essentially, you know, cut the head off of the snake. That's the the footage that we saw, right? Uh, the greenish stuff when you see the, the bomb falling Ooh, back in the day. Yep. Back in the day. Yep. And we still would use that same kind of thing today. Uh, and then, and I think um, now I want to make sure I'm not getting my Middle East conflicts m messed up here, but, uh, you know, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, I know in Afghanistan, I can say it uh, um, confidently there. Uh, these were instances where the Moab was used, the mother of all bombs, mm -hmm. uh, which has more power than a nuke minus any of the uh, radiative effects. Um, and it works by sucking all of the oxygen out. And then everybody inside is, you know, they're just uh, goners. Uh, it's not very pleasant. Um, doesn't sound very pleasant to be on the receiving end of uh, the mother of all bombs it's it's not it, it's it's not and, it's not uh, recommended mm -mm, no and the concept though is still valid that you're going in and you're trying to do everything you can do so that when you finally send in your your ground forces um they're not fighting through an implacable enemy that they can't you know in the case of uh, King's Landing, you know, they can't get over the walls, they can't get under them, they can't get through the gates. Right. So, right. Well, maybe we can so, talk about like a you know, famous battles, let's say D Day, because they didn't have the Air Force to soften up the, the hard targets, then they just went in, got shot yeah. until they were able to just plow through with endless numbers of dead. Had they been able to use their air force, deploy their air force earlier before that, then the whole thing would have looked different. Completely differently, because what we would have done is we would have gone in and we would have cleaned out all of those uh, pillboxes, uh, you know, that were embedded uh, in the side of of the the beaches, where the Germans were able to shoot down, um, you, you know, with impunity. Yeah. And then the other thing we would have done is we would have taken out all of the gun emplacements that were a little bit further back. So have you seen Band of Brothers? Of course. Yeah. So in Band of Brothers, of course, one of the most famous uh, parts of it actually were when the um, uh, Echo or Easy Company gets in and, and they go in and remember how they take out those guns at that... Uh, at the chateau, it's like a, I don't know if it was a chateau, but it was a, maybe it was a church. I forget, but it was, was the a, guys running all over the place. Yes. Oh, yes. wow. That was, uh, that was strong. I need to rewatch it. I watched it once, like whatever, 15, 20 years ago when it came out. Okay, go ahead. That is one of the best, uh, examples of how you would do that without aircraft. And in fact, that is still taught at the U S military Academy mm -hmm. at West point today. Mm -hmm. Um, a little fun fact. My wife actually was one of the historical researchers on band of brothers. Nah, really? Yeah. Yes. Ah, mm -hmm. That is a fun fact. Yeah. What does she and do also, your wife? She's a historian. She, she's an historian and she helps authors and, uh, people like Tom Hanks and wow. that get their facts straight in their movies. She also did, um, Saving Private Ryan, uh, John on. Adams. 
So, and in Saving Private Ryan, you know, what we did there, of course, is it, going back to how, how did we do D-Day? Well, you know, we just threw people at it, yeah. right? Until eventually somebody's going to get through. We've all yeah. played video games where, you know, you're, you, you think you've got all your defenses set up, but... If yeah. they can throw enough bodies at it, they're going to yeah. get through. It's like zombies, just like you know, World War Z. <laughs> World War Z coming yeah. coming into uh, yeah. coming into Jerusalem, you know, going up over the wall, you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, uh, but hey, God, was yeah, that, happy? That... Was your wife happy with uh, with the way that they portrayed uh, uh, band in, uh, thing, like battles in Band of Brothers and uh, Saving Private Ryan in terms of uh, how uh, historically correct it was? Well her actual expertise was in their language and mm -hmm. how they spoke and the idea was so that um you know somebody in band of brothers wouldn't say something that jumped out so they wouldn't say far out or whatever mm -hmm. and uh and you do get that amazing feeling in all three of those examples uh of what it might have been like back then and i think her colleagues on the team who worked on those issues um uh, did a really great job, uh, Dale Dye and many others, uh, who, you know, really knew what they were doing. They, they made it realistic and see that. So if we go back to D and D, that was their biggest problem. If they had spent some money, uh, and, <laughs> and we know they had it, yeah, they yeah. could have really, and, and look, you still could have had the same kind of ending. She didn't, uh, you know, in the sense that she could have been, you know, destroyed at the end. Okay, sure. There's many ways to do it. It's just that it doesn't, it didn't make a lot of sense other than, no. you know, she was psychotic. Uh, and, you know, the hope is that uh, in any kind of a war fighting organization that you're able to have checks and balances you know, on your commander in chief. Right. <laughs> she was just basically, she was like uh, the biggest terrorist uh, in the world. Just like, I'm going to kill all these people just because I can. Yeah. But, but so, so her strategy, even though, you know, so it wasn't uh, very nuanced in terms of uh, writing, but it was the right strategy to come in and first take care of all the things that can hurt you. Oh yeah, for sure. And no then, question. And then it's yours for the taking. Well, yeah. There's nothing left uh, to, to, to fight you. So in, in, in an example of this would be in modern day, mm -hmm. you, might, you might have a way of testing somebody's defenses and probe in and out. The Russians do it all the time. They come, they come as close to our international airspace over Alaska as they can. Okay. And they cause us to scramble fighters and go out and escort them away. Well, when they do that, clearly their goal is to time it, understand it, and know exactly how we're going to react so that if they ever needed to, they could come up with a, a counter plan to, to uh, overcome mm. that resistance. Mm. So she sort of learned from the episode before. Yeah. She went in with much greater speed, much greater ferocity. And lower. Um, was, and was, lower is that yep. realistic is that something in uh, that is realistic in terms of uh, the way you, you use your air force that you go low is that better than definitely doing? yeah yeah and that's not only for whatever radar purposes whatever you see in the movies this is also it's it's easier to not get hit but by, by anti-aircraft uh, weapons when you're flying low it depends so yes it could be there are other times when, if depending on their AAA and aircraft artillery that they have, you may want to be very high up and do, uh, you know, high altitude precision. Yeah. Be like bombing. out of range. Mm -hmm. Well, and if we step back, let's uh, in Game of Thrones. Remember the time where uh, John flies his dragon really high up above the mm -hmm. clouds. Yeah. And, and that was, I don't remember which episode, but it was yeah, before all of this. Yeah, it was more of, yeah, it was like, I think he was doing it more for fun, right? Yeah. Like, ooh, this is the wonder and the awe of flying these things, yeah. which is understandable, right? Yeah. So, 
But in my mind, when I saw that, I thought, ah, they're teeing this up so that they will be so high up and then do a quick dive down and they won't know what hit them. Only that's not how they did it. (laughs) They instead came in where they could be seen by God and everybody. And what about, now I'm remembering, in the battle of, for, for the dawn or whatever it was, like the third episode, whatever it was, like the, was dark, like a battle for Winterfell, whatever it was. Right. So, so she couldn't use her air superiority, they couldn't use, because of all the smoke and all kinds of, let's say, let's call it, you know, there's this uh, term, uh, whatever, all kinds of stuff, whatever, to prohibit, uh, to deflect. Oh, like chaff and... Okay. Stuff like that. Okay. Right. What's that? Yeah, in other Explain words, a bit, a little bit about well, it, it wouldn't actually be chaff in that example, but what you do with chaff is you're just shooting out a bunch of pieces of, of mm-hmm. metal mm-hmm. Yeah. and okay. it confuses radar. What you're talking about is basically there was just ground cover and fog and, or smoke or whatever it was. And they just couldn't see what, where things were in order to mm-hmm. go after them. So that's, that's weather idea. conditions maybe. Yeah, that's more probably weather, you know, and of course, again, in modern day, we overcome it using things like a synthetic aperture radar. Uh, what's, which, that? what's that? What's that? So a synthetic aperture radar is a type of radar that is able to see through uh, any conditions and in fact uh, can even do uh, uh, what we call ground penetrating radar. So, mm. okay. you, oh yes, it's very interesting. Um, we use it for science, not just... Uh, mm-hmm. the military and uh, the idea is that with SAR um, you're not impacted uh, by what the weather is you're also not impacted by canopies so over trees a lot of times mm-hmm. mm-hmm. that's right because you can tune the frequencies to kind of ignore that and tell it hey mm-hmm. I'm just looking for you know certain shapes and certain really uh, material wow. types so what kind of image does the pilot see on the radar that 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 he or she can discern okay this is this 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 is that or is it just like all computerized and tell and tells the pilot this is where you should uh, throw the bomb well so when you look at imagery from that kind of radar it it looks like blobs but essentially what happens with either the operator or somebody on um a different aircraft like an AWACS uh, which is a airborne control center. Okay. Uh, they they know how to interpret that imagery to know what they're looking for. And they tell the uh, pilot this is where whatever coordinates and stuff. Yes. Yep. Mm-hmm. And then they they can you know then they have numerous ways of uh, trying to target it. Uh, so ideally, you're using really precise GPS coordinates because back in the uh, first Gulf War, we relied a lot on laser pointing but mm. the issue with that is it can't penetrate through yeah fog and smoke, smoke and, and yeah. fog and all that stuff and also right. someone has to be there on the ground to point correct the laser correct so yeah, yeah. uh although i want to say there may have been pods that did the laser on board the aircraft too but regardless you got to have generally you're going to have tipping and cueing of some sort so Daenerys could have even done that because surely she could have Tyrion could have gotten spies in there or even um, or uh, Bran also Bran uh, in the Battle for Winterfell Uh, he had all the birds uh, send out uh, the birds yeah, Tell thank you her for reminding me. What's go- sorry, <laughs> <laughs> but but we're just using it not to rant because we know it was it was shitty. Just like to learn something about the way that the actual air force is being used it, it, to make it realistic. They could have done that. Bran is using the birds as reconnaissance, whatever, and then yeah. this is where the where shit is going down. This is where you can't go. Fire now, fire later. Mm. I don't know something. It could have been. <laughs> 